one. Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today, Sunday, well, it's Saturday. Sunday we will be resting. As we close our absolutely fabulous virtual 95 annual general meeting of RNO, the first ever virtual general meeting. To round off our AGM festivities, we have our much anticipated keynote panel presentation celebrating the year of the nurse, scaling up our voices. My golly, I cannot even think about the poor politicians here in Ontario. All right. All right. If, we, if we will scale up our voice even more, but that's exactly what Dr. Barbara Stilwell and Dr. Mary Wilkfield will help us do today with all of us joining. I'm Doris Greenspoon, RNO's proud CEO, and I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by our colleagues, Barbara Stilwell, Executive Director of Nursing Now Global, and the first NP in the United Kingdom, and they want to move and shape things forward. So hint, hint for the nurse practitioners in the group, this is someone you want to keep your eye on and someone that can advise you also very well. Also with us today is Mary Wickfield. And I need to tell you that when I heard that President Obama had appointed Mary Wickfield to her position, I was just impressed even more than what already I had been by him being elected. So she is the former deputy secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, an administrator, health resources and services administrator, HRSA, and deputy secret secretary, US Department of Health and Human Services under President Obama, a position that I believe, and she will correct me if, if I am wrong, for eight years. During today's session, we will hear from our global experts on their personal journey to voice and their collective journey to voice and their views on voice and how we can set the foundation for the next generation of nurses in their view. Their distinct expertises bring rich perspectives on how we as nurses are scaling up our voices in different contexts. Dr. Stilwell was one of the first nurse practitioners. I mentioned that to you. And she, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I do want to add to her intro, the fact that she is the CEO of Nursing Now Global. And I was reflecting on that more than once and yesterday again, what is it about Nursing Now colleagues that has made it this contagious phenomena across the world? What is it that has made it this coalescing force that has brought nursing together? I would say like nothing before has happened in nursing. So with this, I want to plead to her not to, not to just do this three years or three and a half years, but to continue this phenomena forward. However, before joining Nursing Now, she was InterHealth International Senior Director of Health Workforce Solutions, and recently served as Director of Health Workforce and System Strengthening Project in West Bank, Gaza. Another piece in common, Barbara, that we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. And from 1996 to 2006, she worked with the World Health Organization, WHO, in health system development co-authoring the WHO 2006 health report, collecting and analyzing data regarding the impact of, migrant, of migrants on health systems in developing countries. Dr. Mary Wilfeld was appointed, as I said, in 2009 by President Barack Obama to the position of her son, I mentioned that before, and in 2015, she became also the Acting Deputy Secretary, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I can just imagine what must have been and what a pleasure must have been and hard work to work eight years with President Obama. As the head of HRSA, an agency of HHS with a budget of $12 billion, 
Her portfolio, including leading over 80 programs that serve vulnerable populations. This is an area, Mary, that I have shared with you. We have huge passion and huge dedication to. Ranging from rural health delivery to supporting people living with HIV. In the role of deputy secretary, her responsibilities included strengthening the Indian Health Service and over services and overseeing the management of HHS operating divisions, which comprise the one trillion, okay, these are big numbers, dollars US cabinet agency. Currently, she's a distinguished visiting professor at University of Texas in Austin. Welcome Barbara and Mary. And it is an absolutely huge pleasure to have you with us, albeit virtual. You were supposed to be in person and I wish that that would be the case, but mm -hmm. virtual will do this time and we welcome very much uh, you being with us. Thank you. Let us begin by he hearing a bit about their musings, I would call it. Overall, free range musings about what led them to voice? What should be happening with boys? What are the general views, perspectives that they have on this topic? Uh, uh, please, let's uh, move ahead first uh, with you, uh, Mary. Great, thank you very much, Doris. And before I jump in to address the topic at hand, I do want to acknowledge RNAO, the president, the CEO, the board, not only because you do incredibly important work on behalf of nurses in Ontario and on behalf of the health of the residents of your province, but your leadership, RNAO's leadership, benefits nurses and the health of communities thousands of miles away from you. Your efforts and the efforts of all of your members directly contribute to RNAO's incredibly important mission which as the listeners today know, includes advocating for healthy public policy. And your mission includes influencing decisions that affect nurses and the public that they serve. Today, the focus of our conversation about the need to scale up our voices is really a prerequisite to advocating for healthy public policy. And Scaling up our voices is a prerequisite to influencing decisions that affect nurses and the public. In other words, to fully achieve your mission, RNAO's mission in your province, across Canada and elsewhere, it requires all of our voices. Additionally, I wanna comment on RNAO's vision because your vision statement is really important too, where you speak to broader critical issues of equity and social justice. That's a focus too, where scaling up nursing's voice matters, not just in the United States, where the need to work toward health equity could not be clearer. But scaling up voices is an issue that is international. It's important for nurses to engage in Canada and frankly, around the world. So this is all by way of acknowledging RNAO's leadership on important issues and RNAO's meaningful commitment to addressing those important issues. That doesn't just happen. RNAO really is a best in class model for other organizations that are working to support similar goals. So with that, let me look more specifically and talk more specifically about why scaling up our voices is so important. And I'm going to share just a few examples of how I as a nurse came to that recognition. In addition though, to highlighting briefly some of my professional experiences, You'll also hear what I believe are three fairly important points in my remarks. And I'll start by sharing those three important points right now, and then kind of talking about them over the next few minutes. My first point of the three is this. Too often, nurses are recognized only for what we do as nurses. Not nearly enough are we recognized for what we say. This is the case even though nurses have had expertise in healthcare, more expertise in healthcare when they were seniors in college in their nursing education programs than, for example, many policymakers have, or even many members of the public have. So that's my first point. Nurses have more expertise, have tremendous expertise, 
but we're recognized more for what we do than for what we say. My second point, nurses' voices are needed. There are always gaps in knowledge, always gaps in health knowledge that can benefit from nurses' expertise. Nurses have the expertise to fill in and build in those knowledge gaps, whether those gaps appear across the public and their understanding of health issues, policymakers, business leaders, community leaders, whomever. Nurses have expertise to fill in knowledge gaps. And that brings me to the third point. That is that when nurses are tapped, let me reframe that. When nurses are not tapped as a health resource or an expert, that is due in part, I think, because nurses do not always recognize the importance of or engage in this role. They don't always recognize the importance of participating, expressing our voice as part of a professional association or as an individual nurse. And that's probably why this topic was selected for our conversation today. Well, let me expand a little bit on those three points. And I'll begin with events of this year to illustrate the first point. That is that nurses are recognized for what they do, but not nearly enough for what they say. This year, we have WHO's wonderful acknowledgement of nursing's contributions to global health by their designating 2020 as the year of the nurse. And, uh, and through that, but through WHO's focusing extensively on what nursing does or what nurses do. And as a result of the pandemic also this year, there is vast public and policymaker recognition of the contributions that nurses are making in Canada and around the world. Nurses are recognized for standing between COVID-19 and the threatened health of individuals and communities. In other words, as a result of the WHO declaration, as a result of the pandemic, nurses have garnered an intense amount of visibility, of attention, and of appreciation for what our profession does. There is broad recognition and appreciation for the work that we do. Where we don't consistently have nearly as much attention directed is to the value of what nurses say. Nurses are not consistently sought out as spokespeople by our hometown newspapers or our local radio stations. Our press releases from nurses associations are not always covered the way medical association statements, for example, on health, health might be covered in different parts of, of my country and in some parts I would guess of yours. Yet, yes, it's true. In some places, we have strong nurses associations. No doubt about it. RNAO is one of them. But from local to national to international levels, that strength of voice is not consistently found. And it's this gap that can be filled through each of our individual efforts and together through our collective efforts. You might be wondering, well, we're already contributing so much by what we're doing. Why is scaling up our voice so important? Nursing's voices and perspectives are important inside health systems, of course, where they are already heard. But outside, they're not heard as much, but they're equally important and perhaps even more so because simply put, the health of the public is not just impacted by what we or others do inside health systems. The public's health is impacted in many ways by what happens outside the walls of the clinic and hospital. Wherever the health of the public is impacted, there is the need for nursing's voice. Whether it's in a public discussion or a policymaker discussion about health impacts of climate change or the health impacts of inequity in healthcare. For example, when public policymakers make decisions from local to provincial to national government about health and health care, their decisions can make the difference between health and illness for thousands of people and millions of people. Because of this, nurses using our voices to inform and advocate for health-related public policy, that isn't some nicety, it's a necessity. From patient rooms to boardrooms to legislators' hearing rooms, all of these places are places where decisions about health are being made and without our expertise applied to influence and inform those decisions, those decisions can be crafted in a knowledge vacuum. That is without the benefit then of nursing's expertise and the knowledge that nurses bring. It's certainly true in the United States. And I would say as an aside, particularly right now, I think it's true. 
and I'm guessing it's occasionally true in Canada as well, that not every decision that's made by a policymaker or by a policymaking body, whether it's a city council decision to a president's decision to a prime minister's decision, not all the time through all of history is a well-informed decision made that truly advances health. But nurses can help change that equation when we use our voices. I first learned the power of nursing's voice outside of the bricks and mortar of the healthcare systems where I first worked. When I was fresh out of college, I was an active member of my nursing association, my local chapter and my state nurses association. Decades ago now, nursing leaders in my home state taught me that through our district and state nurses association meetings, they taught me in those meetings the importance of showing up and talking to policymakers, educating them about health, about health care, about the nursing profession. Those experiences taught me that as a nurse, I could certainly help to improve health and health care, but not just in the intensive care unit where I worked as a practicing nurse. I could also influence health and health care by engaging with federal and state legislators to influence those very strong, powerful forces outside of healthcare systems that also, of course, impacted the health of the people for whom I was providing nursing care in those ICUs. Over time, it became clear to me that while I could impact the health of one or two ICU patients on a shift, or I could also contribute to the knowledge of 40 nursing students when I was teaching, both of those extremely important, but it also became crystal clear to me that I could use my expertise and my voice in informing health policy. And when I did that, I could impact not just one or two or 40 students, I could impact the health of 20,000 or 20 million or 200 million people. Not that one or the other is more important, but rather they are all important for nurses' expertise. Eventually, not ever having stepped foot in the United States Capitol, the nation's, my nation's <laughs> capital, I took a risk. I applied for and I was offered a position working for a United States Senator in Washington, DC, leaving behind a comfortable tenured nursing college faculty position at, a, at my local university leaving that to go to work in an environment where I had never been before, but where I knew that working there as a nurse was important. It was important because what was done there influenced health and healthcare. As the Senator's legislative, health legislative assistant, I made sure that the first thing anybody who met me knew about me was this. I made sure that they knew I was a nurse. I worked ultimately for over eight years in the US uh, Capitol. I worked at first as a health LA, as I mentioned, and then as a chief of staff. And by the way, I was one of the only two nurses who were chiefs of staff to United States senators. I was one of a handful of nurses, just a handful of nurses that worked on Capitol Hill. And let me tell you this, more often than not, I was asked by people who I met, other legislators, uh, staff, lobbyists, constituents, et cetera, I was asked more often than not, my goodness, you're a nurse, then what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Because they didn't see me practicing clinically. They didn't see me teaching in a college of nursing. What is a nurse doing here? My answer to them consistently and every time was, it's because I am a nurse that I'm here. Of course, it's because I am a nurse. Because here, laws are made that impact, for example, patients with cancer. Here, laws are shaped that inform access to health insurance coverage. Here, laws are enacted that impact children's emergency medical services to uh, uh, children's emergency medical services. None of those laws should be passed in a knowledge vacuum. Most of my peers with whom I worked, who also worked on helping to craft policy, were lawyers and political science majors. They were experts to be sure in legal processes, but they didn't have the expertise of practicing in healthcare that I brought to Capitol Hill. Then that nurse's expertise, expertise that is very relevant to health policy. And there was something else that they didn't have that nurses have that is very policy relevant. And that is that for our profession, first and foremost, we always put the health needs of patients and the public first and foremost, not our self-interest, not my personal interest, not even my profession's interest, first and foremost, the health of the public and, their, and the health of patients. This is the North Star of our profession. 
the North Star for every single decision that I made working in the United States Congress and ultimately working for President Barack Obama in the US Department of Health and, and Human Services. And by the way, the first nurse ever appointed to either of those positions, I'm pleased to say, mm -hmm. kind of hoping I broke that glass ceiling for many nurses to come behind. As a first nurse appointed there, always and every time, the decisions that I made were guided by what was in the best interest of the health of the population, of our communities, of our nation, of the globe. That was my guiding star. It was my guiding star because that is the fundamental values that ner the nursing profession has, always in the public's interest. Nursing values, nursing education, and nursing expertise were what guided my decisions every single day on Capitol Hill, and in the US administration. Let me put this a slightly different way. You can be the nurse practitioner that provides a cancer screening for a patient. You can be the hospital nurse who provides care for patients with cancer. You can be the faculty member who teaches students to provide exceptional care for cancer patients. But regardless of which of those nursing roles you fill, you can also be the nurse who communicates cancer-related research findings to members of the parliament or to your provincial health department. You can communicate about the problems that you have seen people with cancer face. You can share with the media, policymakers, and the public your experience, your expertise, and your research findings about your, this population's health needs. You can be the nurse who, based on your nursing expertise, talks with the policy, policymakers, with the media, with communities about potential and poli potential policy and other solutions to problems that populations facing cancer need to address. In Canada and the United States, nurses are a respected profession. And that's a critically important foundation when we speak. It's a foundation that's important, particularly I think right now, that our words matter. I would say that the public's need for accurate information is so acute right now. A profession that is so trusted by the public, nurses' voices really need to be used to fight back against distortions, half-truths, and disinformation campaigns about health and other related issues that impact health. And those distortions are all over the social media and they directly impact on decisions that the public and sometimes policymakers make. It might be a baseless assertion about vaccines or it might be a, a, an observation from a high ranking official about the potential for use of bleach sometimes taken internally to avoid COVID-19 related illness. As nurses, we would never think of deviating from using science to inform our practice. Yet we see misinformation entering the public discourse. And more broadly, we are seeing the cultivation of public attitudes at times seemingly to distrust science as well. As one US-based think tank recently and cleverly called it, we're, witness we're witnessing truth decay. It's really rather startling because as a human population on this planet, we've been moving forward century after century informed by science. We're in strange times that needs the voice of nurses, a trusted voice to take up the cause of accurate information. Degrading or ignoring evidence in health or health policy, it has been good for anyone. Finally, using our voices capitalizes on two activities that nurses are exquisitely good at, advocating, and educating. Those skills we bring to communicating within healthcare are the very same skills, advocating and educating, that are needed to communicate outside of health settings. In the United States recently, there's been some re increased recognition that not everybody is listening to our government, the government spokespeople, for example. But there is a belief that many people are likely to listen to experts in their own communities. And I would say that that's where nurses haven't consistently claimed their space, scaling up our voices within our own communities. That is needed. Sometimes solo, we can do this, and sometimes we can do this in partnership, wherever we have a common agenda. Building local partnerships with two or three other sectors and speaking to important health issues. Nurses are experts who can highlight issues ranging from opioid use disorder, to COVID presentation to childhood injuries. There is a role for every nursing voice and it needn't be full-time to make it a meaningful contribution. When it comes to the health of your communities and your country, oh yes, nurses' voices matter. Thank you, Doris, and I'll turn it back to you.
It's absolutely okay. fantastic, Mary. And I know that people are already itching with questions, but they do need to know that we got questions from others. So they will need to post the questions. Before we do that, we are going to move to Barbara. But um, the more I hear you, Mary, and this is not the first time I hear you, and I miss to say to people that Mary is one also of the <coughs> few leaders internationally that has been named <coughs> living legend of the American Academy of Nurses. And I had the privilege to be there when she was appointed to that absolutely highest honor. So Mary, uh, every time I hear you, I learn more and thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, let, let me introduce, not introduce because I did, let me ask now Barbara still will to take it from here and give her musings. And I call them musings because I gave them free range to really speak about their views on scaling up voice um, from either individual or collective perspective or both. So Barbara, the podium is yours. Thank you. And I, Thank you. I, I do need to say a caveat about Barbara. I only know Barbara, I think for the last year but I feel we are sisters. I must say that right away. <laughs> From the first moment we spoke on WhatsApp uh, mm -hmm. to every time I hear her, because yesterday I, or the day before I was saying my musings about why nursing now was so compelling and that was not a bureaucratic organization. And that it felt like, you know, social movement. And then she started to give me a speech about social movement, which <laughs> might be Exactly, you can hear my colleagues know yeah. that that's what we use at Arenio. What you don't know is that actually Barbara wrote a chapter on it that we will share with everybody. <laughs> Your podium, Barbara. Thank you, Doris, so much. And thank you, Mary, for such an inspiring uh, opening. It was just wonderful to hear. It's the first time I've heard you and uh, I hope it won't be the last. It was super, thank you. I'm so impressed by what you've done and the leadership you've shown. Um, Doris, I also want to just open by thanking um, the RNAO and in particular you and your team for working with Nursing Now so collaboratively over the last year. Um, we were led to you by a star um, from, Japan, from Johns Hopkins who said you need to get in touch with Doris Patricia and her Davis team. Gone. Patricia yeah. Davis, the, that's the, right. The Dean of Johns Hopkins the University. The Dean of Johns Hopkins, exactly. I was she thrilled said, when she connected us. Yes, she said, you need to get in touch with Doris because we were asking about disseminating evidence-based practice, which is one of the goals of nursing now is to make those connections better so that nurses anywhere in the world can find out what's the best evidence. And thank goodness they put us in touch with you. Um, because, you know, the work that you all have done on that and not only identifying best practice, but implementing best practice, which is often in many disciplines, the missing link. Everybody's very good at saying, oh, I know what it is, but how do you get people to change what they do? And in fact, that was some of my very early work was on decision making in health professionals and how they made the decisions they make. And what I found was that I, I looked at both nurses and physicians for comparison. And what I found was they were all deeply in love with their own decisions. And it didn't matter how good the evidence was, it was incredibly difficult to get them to change. So therefore my admiration for what you do is, um, was from the very get go unbounded because Getting people to change is extremely difficult. Um, even with the best intentions, even though cognitively they know they must change, it's very difficult to do. Um, and so my admiration for the work that you and your team do is fantastically over the top. And I'm very inspired by your tagline, um, knowledge, compassion, courage. I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's about applying knowledge with compassion and having the courage to change. And, you know, I just, I've, the first time I've come across those three words together, I love them. 
So thank you so much for all the inspiration over the last year, Doris. It hasn't gone unnoticed or unappreciated and we thank you. And I know there are many people who've joined our webinars who share that view. So I was thinking about um, becoming the first nurse practitioner in the UK and introducing the first program in the UK. It was an overnight success. It took 15 years, that's all, to get the first program from the first cohort to the first program, 15 years. Um, and I was thinking, you know, that, and as I was saying about change, a lot of the stuff about change is people don't want to change. And so a lot of the opposition came from physicians um, and a lot of the opposition came from nurses because they didn't want to change at that time. This is way back at the beginning of the 90s. Um, and I was lucky, I was able to go to the United States to train as a nurse practitioner. So I could see some of the things that Mary was talking about, um, the role of the nurse practitioner, the way the nurse practitioner was a leader, the way the nurse practitioner knew their stuff, they had the knowledge, the compassion, and the courage um, to practice. And I also was lucky enough to go to McMaster. Uh, I had a scholarship to go to McMaster. So I learned about generating evidence at a time when it was deeply unfashionable. Nobody wanted to know about evidence, um, but so important. And what it did was it really ignited in me a passion for, for being a nurse practitioner and for, if you like, being an evangelical nurse practitioner, sharing this message. And I think, Doris, that in, we recognize in each other the importance of passion. Um, I'm also- I'm, go I'm, going going to start to, I'm going to start to call myself evangelical, BPG, BPSO. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> and it was the passion that kept me going even over 15 years when, you know, some of the criticism, some of the, some of the, the sort of destructive um, remarks that people would make about nurse practitioners, you know, at times would make me feel so depressed, but what made me continue to get out and do it was a passion for believing that this was good for people in the health sector. People were coming into the health sector, they knew they had six minutes with the doctor. You know, it was enough to go in and say, my name's Mary, I want this. Um, you know, I've come with a sore throat. The doctor to say, yes, let me have a look. Okay, write a prescription. That was it, basically. But I knew as a nurse and a public health nurse, a community nurse, that people had stories and they needed to tell us their stories for us to fully understand what they needed from us. And I believe that's one of the real hearts of nursing is that you create that relationship with somebody who comes to you. And it's within that, that together you can look at the care pathway. The problem for nursing, I think, is that passion sometimes is identified as a kind of a weakness. Um, almost as a, as a kind of, it's where they come in with this kind of vocational, though it's a vocation, you know, as long as you're a caring woman, that's all you really need. Um, and of course, it's absolute rubbish, absolute rubbish. As my friend who was a chief nurse says, shall I send you a caring woman then, or shall I send you a fully qualified nurse to look after you? And we know which one people choose. But it's that, sometimes that passion, I think, and the way that people speak about nursing, that, um, that, uh, that makes the listeners not fully understand what nursing is about. And that's not to say we should get rid of the passion. I used to be in another part of my life, a singer. Uh, I used to sing opera and I loved it more than any, almost anything, almost more than nursing, if I'm really honest. Um, I had a passion for it, but the passion I had for singing made me a more sensitive singer. And it made me listen to the other singers so that I could tune myself 
you know, into where I needed to be. And I believe that's what we bring into a multidisciplinary team. We bring the passion, we bring the listening, and we bring the advocacy and joint, joint work that we do with patients and people we see. And that's why I accepted this job as executive director of the Global Nursing Now movement, because I know, um, because you know, I've been working globally for, for 25 years, that all around the world, I can go and talk to nurses and we share this language. Just like we three who've spoken this morning, we could have a conversation. We all understand what we're saying. And that, you know, that's so important. We all share this passion. What's, what's really come home to me in, in working on this campaign is that nursing, it's time for nursing. It's nursing's time. I mean, I would have said that before COVID-19. After COVID-19, how can anybody question the value that nursing brings, nursing and nurses? Um, in all kinds of world, in all kinds of ways. And what we need is the self agency to be able to speak. And that's what RNAO has facilitated for so many nurses and what nursing now needs to continue to facilitate. We did a leadership survey last year, 2019, um, and we had over two and a half thousand responses. Um, what they told us was that although they were, all, many of them in leadership positions, first of all, they were appointed without a budget and without any staff. They were set up to fail. And so people would look, you know, the, the men would look at them and say, well, we told you not to appoint a woman. We told you not to appoint a nurse. So the sort of advocacy Mary's talking about, advocating for a budget, for the people to do the work, for you to be part of the team, it's critical for self-agency. They also told us that they didn't, a lot of these nurses, over half of them did not feel comfortable speaking in a crowded room of senior decision makers. And that's where I think we need to get this data dialogue decision-making continuum really very strongly in place so that nurses all feel they can look at the data and make an argument. And sometimes that gets you into trouble, as you know, Mary was saying, and I really resonated with that. I, and I think you were too, Doris, that you know, there was a nurse practitioner who was on my first program. She came in one week and she said, I've been fired. And I said, why on earth? And she said, because I told the doctor that what he was doing wasn't evidence-based. And this doctor, physician, was putting um, gentian violet on a leg ulcer. I mean, the worst possible thing you could do. And she said, you can't do that. Um, and he fired her on the spot. Of course, we appealed and um, she was reinstated. But, you know, it's that principle of nurses do know um, and it's giving, helping, supporting nurses to have that self-agency to speak. And I know what, that's what you do too, Doris. So I think you can tell <laughs> that my passion um, for nurses and nursing, um, and I have to say for equity, social justice, all the things I think that, you know, nursing can have a voice in. And I was reading your LTC, Long-Term Care Report, and the courage to put that out after all of these reports, you know, here's another one. Um, good for you, good for you. And you know, this is what we, this is where we need to be going in nursing. And that's why I'm the ED. Thank you so very much, Barbara, fantastic. And Mary to you too. Uh, I want to start with one question and then move to the questions that people send. <clears throat> And the reason I want to start with this question is because um, for Areneo, actually is the likely the only challenging one to take us as Areneo, and, and I appreciate you gave Areneo and all of us tons of kudos. And many of those kudos belong to nurses that also speak out with us and for us. And yes, we train them and we give them materials so we did really do a lot of capacity building for that. Nonetheless, uh, and you have an example right at your backyard, 
Barbara, so let me comment nonetheless. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, we have now a nurse, uh, I'm not going to name her because she's with the lawyer, um, <clears throat> a nurse in a nursing home, an RN uh, in a nursing home that was um, asked to resign. That's a nice way of putting the firing uh, for not agreeing to put a resident, a, a person from a hospital that was coming COVID positive with a resident that is not COVID positive. Example, similar to what you said about the nurse practitioner for basically refusing to do the wrong thing. Uh, we have a past president uh, and people all know about her, Vanessa Burkowski, similarly was firing, fired for speaking up. Got resolved. This nurse that I'm talking will get resolved. Recently, now in the UK, uh, you have uh, the chief nurse of England, Ruth May, I just read recently in the newspaper, that was, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, too much talking the last few days. She was dropped from the daily briefings on COVID for refusing to back um, uh, Mr. Dominic Cummings. Just so my colleagues know who Dominic Cummings is. Dominic Cummings is a high person in uh, the prime minister office that drove his family from London to Durham while his wife had suspected COVID positive. And at the time, you know, there was a whole lockdown nonetheless they went about and around. And because she did not agree to back him, to back the government, if it's my understanding, she was dropped from that briefing now. So the issue is this for RNO. Many times we know of nurses that have fantastic stories, real stories, compelling stories about their practice. They do not need, nor do they want to disclose the name of the organization or the name of patients. Of course, they wouldn't. They just want to share the story. Sometimes those stories, just to give you a, a, a even more worst case scenario, are good stories, not even bad stories. An and they need to go through the hula hoops of organizations to actually get approval to speak with the media. And the answer at the end is none, no. Uh, so what do I do? I go sometimes directly to president and CEOs of organizations. My golly, you just took all your hospital out of COVID outbreak. That's marvelous. Give me please a nurse to speak about that in the national news because it's something good. We prefer not to. Doctors, you know, and Mary alluded to this, are much more freer. It's not that they are quoted more in Ontario at least not in Ontario, because we have been, I think my, my communication person told me like 17 hits we had in the media in the last four months, five months, that's a lot. No, no, no physician organization has succeeded to have that, no single doctor, but doctors can go. If the national media calls a doctor, the doctor can say, yep, I'm coming at 8 p.m. The nurse cannot. So, how do you work within the constraints of the system where nurses, because nurses are employed by organizations, need the approval of organizations. Doctors in Canada are not employed by the organizations. Therefore, the word you use, Barbara, of agency, right? Very important sociological word. Both can have agency but the doctor is free to enact this agency or her agency and the nurse is not. If both of you can comment a bit on that, because to our, for RNO, that will be very, very hopeful, uh, helpful, hopefully, hopefully also hopeful. And then we will go with the questions that people sent in advance. Who wants to take a stab? Barbara, mm -hmm. you want, or Mary? Doesn't matter. I'll make just a couple of comments. Thanks, Doris. The um, uh, yes, I understand, and I think it's probably true in most countries around the world. Depending on where nurses and other people, for that matter, are employed, uh, and the nature of that employment relationship, they are more or less free to speak out. So, in university settings, as in the United States, 
nurses, especially if they're nursing faculty, particularly if they're tenured, are very free to speak out. And sometimes I think when we're, when we're trying to advance a message, it might be nursing deans of educational programs or senior faculty who can be the, um, uh, in, in some circumstances, the best spokespeople because they are unfettered by uh, um, really tight constraints on what they can say. They, um, they enjoy often more latitude. So, so when can we bring those nurses' voices to the table uh, without compromising nurses in other settings? We don't always want to do that, but that's a strategy. Another strategy, of course, is to have nurses in high-ranking positions, strong nursing leaders who, when they hear their nurse colleagues coming to them with observations, could be positive or, or challenges that they're facing, uh, um, create the space for those nurses to be able to speak out. And, and that happens, as I said, frequently when you've got very strong nursing leaders or they're, um, uh, and they're in the hierarchy of the organization. That tells us we also need to have nurses' voices very high level, not just as a chief nurse, but in, as chief executive officers of uh, home visiting organizations, hospice organizations, long-term care organizations, et cetera. Um, the, the rules vary, as I said, in terms of speaking out. In the United States, our press will often contact people on background. Your name is never used, but what they're looking for is insight to a story. And if you agree to speaking only on background, your name stays out of the story. You've got to agree, you've got to make sure you've got the rules down before you engage with, with press. Um, but, that's, but that also can provide context to an issue uh, that, that people will use. So, um, and, and finally, it's sometimes you make a stand. You take a risk and you make a stand because it's part of the values of the profession, not to harm people, but to be there to help them. And when you see the potential for people to be harmed, then sometimes that stand is, I can't work in this environment. I can't lead this organization. And probably all of us who've been around for a while have stepped away from positions because we have felt that something has been compromised in that environment. And if we can't change it, then we, we need to step away from it. For, for many of us, that we have found ourselves in, in those kinds of positions, I think. Um, lastly, uh, I would say that when nurses want to advocate a particular position in, in, in support of patients, for example, in the public health, that um, in, in that advocacy, they try to help their leaders, nursing leaders or others, see the value add. What's, on, what's the return on investment, if you will, to have a nurse speak out? What's the value that accrues to the organization? That is, we're the first organization to, to, to say publicly, this was a problem in our institution. We're not the only organization that is identifying this as a problem. We're the first one speaking out this is the, I'm a nurse who's speaking to that problem. And here are the four great things that our organization is doing to remedy that issue. Not a unique problem to us, much broader than that. So in other words, it's, it's, it's working with leadership to say, there's value add in this. And in, it, it can, at the end of the day, enhance consumers trust. And you can think about patient safety and medical errors and the whole history of that over the last 20 years. It wasn't easy to flag medical errors in the public domain. But eventually, more and more health systems, nurses, doctors, others, led that charge to say, we're human. The air is human. And we need to recognize that. And here are the things we're doing to fix it. So it isn't to lay blame without also having a solution to the challenge. And that's what I think we try to bring when we're talking to, to uh, um, our organization's leaders. So those are the four or five thoughts I have about that. I'll stop, Doris. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Barbara, anything you would like to add or is different? perspectives or add to it? Just, um, just a couple of things. One is um, to share um, some advice that somebody gave me many years ago when I was doing a leadership program. Um, they said to me, be the leader you can be today. So don't think about the leader you can be in 20 years or you know the one you have been or the one you could be if you weren't in this job, but what can you do now? And I think that that really, I remembered that. It was over 20 years ago he said that to me, but I remembered it because I've never, never, ever forgotten it because it is very wise. Because what it does is it makes you manage the situation, which is what, you know, Mary's been giving us some great pointers about the sorts of alternatives that we might have. 
So there are some things that are real bottom line things. You know, I am not going to do this. I'm going to talk about this. It's unsafe. And PPE has been a good example of this. We've had lots of people speaking out publicly about PPE and the lack of it here, um, how inadequate it's been. And, you know, absolutely, that's about safety and lives. Um, you can't compromise on that. But there are other things which may be management things or you may not actually have first-hand knowledge of or, you know, so then you can think, well, who are my allies? Who can I go and talk to? Where can I get my facts about this? Um, and, you know, it may be the dean of the nursing school is the person you need to go and talk to or the CEO. Um, but what that does is, what thinking about it like that does is it opens those doors instead of closing the doors. Um, and that's, you know, really important. Thank you so much. Let me uh, share with people that we ask colleagues <clears throat> to send questions in advance. So I'm going to send your way a few questions and um, I will direct them to whoever that feels that wants to answer this first one. Uh, the first one is, so yes, COVID put everything uh, that nursing has to offer in on the table. Um, and nurses have been cheered, celebrated, called heroes. Do you think this will perjure, perjure, will, will continue? If, if two years from now, says the question, do you think nurses still will be considered in that high way and what do we need to do, if not, to ensure that that happens and that we change the status of nursing forever or the standing of nursing? I would put myself in parentheses. I'll have a go at that one um, as a first, a first go. The time for clapping, I think, is over uh, or nearly over. We have to change clapping into investment in nursing. And we have state of the world's nursing, which gives us global figures about nursing. 25% of the global education budget goes on nursing. Nurses make up more than 50% of the whole workforce. So calm, you know, this, these figures don't, they're, they're not right. We need more investment in educating nurses and then we need to be sure that nurses have decent working conditions, decent pay, decent places to go to work. And when I worked for WHO, um, you know, I used to work with nurses who worked in really remote clinics in, in sort of very low income countries. And, I, and the Ministry of Health would be wanting advice about what could they do to get more nurses. And, you know, I'd say it's not rocket science. If you're posted to somewhere with no toilet and mosquitoes the size of helicopters, are you going to stay? Of course not. So, you know, what we need to be doing is thinking everybody, the whole team are human beings and to get them to stay and to recruit them, they have to have decent working conditions. And that's what nursing now is going to be pushing for, you know, we've been extended for six months, we're going to continue pushing for this. And we can use state of the world's nursing to hold governments accountable for investing in nursing. We have the data. They have agreed that this data, these data are accurate. Therefore, in England, they say they're going to increase the number of nurses by 40,000. We've got the figures. So if they don't, we need to be going back and asking them, as we do everywhere, and I know you will, and RNAO, Doris, I'm sure our Royal College of Nursing will, and we need to be supporting nurses everywhere to get investment in nursing. It's not a cost, it's an investment. Thank you very much, Mary. Would you like to add the perspective? Very briefly, because I think Barbara uh, just stated it so well. A couple of comments. Um, the, 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 the public's trust in nursing is a very precious currency. You've got money as a currency, you've got trust as a currency. This is a very precious uh, currency, I think. 
And it was earned long before I walked the face of the earth by other nurses, generations of nurses before me. It is what has led in the United States to decades now of Gallup every year um, measuring the public's respect of, for nurses and nurses consistently coming out, out at the top. Number one, most respected <clears throat> a profession, occupation of any listed year after year after year. That is a precious currency to have. We have to earn it just as our predecessors did and as the people who come after us. It's not a currency to squander. So that's sort of point one, gotta earn it. Nurses have been earning it over and over and over this last year in ways that uh, most of us would never have imagined and we certainly would not have wished for. But there it is, it's high visibility for the profession that was already uh, 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 operating from a foundation of strength in terms of the public's trust. Where I think we haven't made the bridge as effectively as we could or should is the whole point of this conversation. And that is the use of our voice and to be heard on issues like Barbara talked about, other issues as well, to be really viewed as experts and valued for the knowledge that we bring, not just to what we do, but to what we say. Because what is said in public, in front of parliament, in hearing rooms, makes the difference in terms of how vast resources and programs are stood up uh, to benefit the public. So our voices need to be there. It's that, it's, it's that work that I think we still need to do. Um, uh, but that this, the, the, this might be the one bright side. It provides us the opportunity to leverage in even more strongly uh, because of public attitudes worldwide about nurses. Thank you. This time, Mary, I'm going to start with you because of uh, your role for many, many years. Um, how important do you think is to invest for an association or for nursing as a profession in actually having nurses in formal uh, policy political decisions. I'm talking both policy and political because at RNO we now are investing quite a bit also in having people running for office, but equally important and I don't think we have invested nearly as much as on what I just said on policy positions at the formal level, at the level of like you, chief of staff, those type of positions that quite frankly, I don't think we have done much on that. How important it is um, as, a, as advice to us? Yeah, let me say it's critical. I, I, if, if I had to think of the one or two things that were most important, it, this would be a, a virtually at the top of the list. And that is having nurses uh, uh, threaded through the fabric of policy and politics for the reasons that I mentioned in my opening remarks, that is, as a practicing nurse, I'm providing extremely important care and, not instead of, but and as a, as a nurse with a voice informing and influencing policy, I'm impacting not just those couple of patients, I'm impacting 200,000 patients or 200, uh, 200 million people. So, so it's that scale, bringing nursing's voice to Scale that's so important. And we do that when nurses run for political office, when nurses serve as senior executives in corporations, when nurses work in the kinds of positions that I did on the, in the U.S. Capitol, on Capitol, my Capitol Hill, and in, and in uh, the U.S. government. I was so fortunate that President Obama saw the value of nurses, not just in appointing me uh, for eight years to serve in senior executive positions, the second uh, most senior position, by the way, in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, first nurse ever to be appointed to either that or the HRSA administrator position, but he appointed nurses in other senior positions as well. So, so and, made, and, and when he did that, he elevated nursing's voice. We need to have people who are receptive and value nurses and hold them accountable. To, uh, to appoint nurses. I was not appointed to a chief nurse position. That's a whole different story. We don't have a chief nurse per se uh, in, the, in the United States, but I was appointed to positions that had latitude uh, uh, for making decisions around scores of programs, billions of dollars uh, in terms of uh, their, their allocation, highly impactful positions. So do we need nurses in those jobs? You bet we do. Do we need nurses in elective office? You bet we do. I can give you the example when we were fighting Zika and I was in the uh, US government at that time, I knew that emergency room nurses would be important. I knew that public health nurses would be important. 
to communicate, to communicate as fast as possible through their nursing members what we knew in real time about Zika so that we wouldn't have lots of, lots of patients unnecessarily using the emergency departments across the United States. I knew that ED nurses would be some of the first nurses that would see patients coming in. So their voices amped up was, were really important. But I knew that as a nurse working in a senior level position. So immediately I had our Centers for Disease Control talking with key nursing organizations so that they knew what we knew in real time, not just other healthcare professionals, but that nurses knew it because of the public's trust. So that when nurses would speak locally, they would be heard uh, and, and would be a viable voice in addition to, to, uh, to the government speaking out. So for all of those reasons, this is incredibly important because of the scale of impact um, but bad policies can be developed, policies that leave people and populations out, policies that, that, that uh, provide solutions that aren't as strong as they can be uh, to address key healthcare problems. That's where nurses' voices can matter so much. Thank you, Mary, that is, uh, you left us with good homework uh, on both ends for formal politics, which we have been successful, but we can do way more, and also for senior positions at the policy level of civil servants. Thank you so much. And by the way, uh, we did attend, uh, the prime minister went to a visit with public health nurses that we organized during nursing week. And at the end, we left him with the message that um, we still need to regain the chief nurse officer position for Canada. And he responded, I'm taking note of that. So hopefully before December 31st, which is the deadline we gave. Hopefully we will get that back. Uh, a question for you first, Barbara, and then Mary can add. I just want to very, not to have all of you, uh, both of you answer uh, the same questions just to give variety. And then we will go uh, Ifra to those that are on the chat line because I cannot even see the chat line for some reason. But let me ask this from Barbara. Uh, Barbara, the role of di that diversity plays in advancing the voice of nurses, please. Say it again, Doris, the role that diversity plays. In advancing the voice of nurses. Okay. And given, okay. given your vast experience internationally and the, the, mm. the you know, um, the various countries that you are involved and also in your own country, the voice of diversity. Yeah. Yes, so critical. Um, what, so I've worked on um, health workforce issues really for 20 years. I mean, all health, big health workforce issues with WHO and then one with IntraHealth. And one of the factors that we look at in health workforce in general is whether the composition of the health workforce represents the composition of the population. Um, and of course, in nursing, it doesn't, and it really never has. And we know now that 90% of nurses globally are women. Um, and this, you know, in a way you could say, well, and, and I have a colleague who says to me, well, that's great because what it does is it gives women economic empowerment. It gives them a chance for a job, you know, in the poorest countries. And she's right, it does, that's what it does. But on the other hand, if we don't pay attention to diversity, we don't fully understand what's going on in the population. You know, we are part of, of the world, um, part of, of, of the community. And so therefore we should pay attention to who is, who's coming into nursing and who is able to stay in nursing. And in some countries, you know, the poorest people can't stay because they, they can't support themselves. And we need to pay attention to that. But we then need, and you know, we've done this uh, sort of fairly substantial um, piece of work on um, women in nursing and leadership. And, and uh, you know, we have male respondents as well, but mostly women. And they talked a lot about attitudes to women um, by, many of the managers who were men, and we know from the WHO report, healthcare delivered by women led by men, that women are often um, managed by men. Um, and, 
you know, they they recount a number of issues and problems with that. Not always, but, you know, sometimes. So we need then to think about intersectionality as well. So it's not, you know, it's not only men and women, but it's it's um, people who are um, who are gay, for example. So we heard from gay men who said they have a lot of discrimination against them, uh, you know, incredible today, but there we are. Um, and other sex sectionalities too, um, which is why we're going to do a session nursing now on racial justice in a couple of weeks time. So critical. Um, so I think, you know, we have to work towards having a nursing, um, a nursing workforce that represents our populations wherever we are and whatever's important in that. But we also, I think, have to learn about not fighting with each other. Um, and, you know, I think in nursing, we've been very good at, at inter-Nissan fighting. We, you know, we spend a lot of energy looking at somebody to blame for something that's happening and not enough energy, I think, convening people, which is what you do so well and what I think we need to learn much more about doing really well. Um, and, you know, the Royal College of Nursing, for example, is extremely good at that. But, you know, I know very well there's a lot of disparate small organisations in, in the UK. Um, and, you know, they often speak very badly about each other. Well, how is that helping? Um, so, you know, we've, we've invited some of the, our male colleagues to write some blogs and articles for us to talk about being a man in nursing. What is that like? You know, how can we support you? And how can you support us, women in nursing? We're going to do the same with racial justice. We're going to try to offer um, a sort of open space where we can really confront some of the attitudes and um, things that, you know, we find difficult to talk about, that sometimes prevents diversity. Diversity is strength. I really believe diversity is strength. And we need to be together. So Barbara, I will invite you to watch, not to see live because you will be sleeping hopefully. On Monday at 6.45, we have, you know, this COVID um, uh, webinars that have become webinars and will continue to be once a week uh, is from 6.45 to 8. And this week, this Monday, it is about, let's talk about discrimination. That openly, let's talk about discrimination because, and let's talk about discrimination in our own profession because it's well and alive. You know, I always say to people, the farther you get from the bedside and the farther you get from the classroom, the whiter we become. And it's a fact. It's a fact in Canada. It's a fact in many of the countries that are prominently white. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and that got to stop too. That's true. Yeah. Mary, would you like to add anything to the issue of, to the topic, important topic of uh, the question that was sent to us, how uh, diversity plays a role in, ad in advancing the voice of nurses? Or um, are you, you do you, well, is any? I would just say that I think Barbara did a great job and I, and I could not agree more with her when she spoke to uh, strength through diversity. Um, I believe that health outcomes show that, uh, how well patients will do uh, uh, when uh, uh, frequently when the care that they're receiving is from uh, um, the, uh, an individual of their race, of their ethnicity, that can matter. We also have data that show that, uh, it, uh, that, that individuals from different uh, racial and ethnic groups will go back and work in the communities or, the, or similar kinds of communities. Often those are communities that are underserved by health professionals. So it's where we need uh, more individuals to be working and there's just a natural uh, uh, um, uh, attraction often uh, for individuals to go home. Part of the reason why I'm back in North Dakota because I'm attracted to being in my home state. And so that, that, that I think influences all of us. And so that natural affinity uh, helps us to fill areas that are in desperate need of more healthcare providers. 
to address these issues, we have a lot of work to do. And that could be the topic of an entire conference, of course. But I would say this, we have to uh, um, add uh, uh, diversity in our senior ranks. Doris, you spoke to that in your comments just a second ago. Uh, um, do we have less and less diversity the further up the ranks you get, whether we're talking about deans of schools of nursing or we're talking about chief nurse executive officers. At least that's true in the U.S., and I would probably put money on the fact that it's probably be true in, in both of the countries you represent as and well. It's true, and it's true not only in nursing, it's true in government. I mean, it's suffice to say when you go to conferences or meetings even of a high level, whether it's policy, political, or nursing, or any profession, and you go and you just scan the room, that's it. Sure. And this for us, I think, starts in education. It starts with who is being admitted? How are those students being supported? Where is the mentorship once uh, individuals are in clinical settings? Where is the mentorship once they are working as educators and researchers? Where are the resources? Where are the diversity supporting programs? And is nursing's voice behind those and saying, this is our, one of our highest priorities? Needs to be. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ifra, I cannot somehow see the chat, it disappeared on me. Um, so either if you can put it back or tell me where, or you just go ahead and ask questions that people have posted in the order they have. Yeah, no problem. I'll go ahead. Um, we have a couple of comments and some questions. I'll start with the questions. Fantastic, thank so you. The first is from Rhonda Seedman Carlson. Um, she says, I could not agree with you more, Barbara, on how passion can be a detriment at times. What are your thoughts around nurses being called angels or heroes? I think this ties into what Mary said about being recognized by what we do and not what we say. Being angels or heroes is to idealize the activities, but not the thoughts, ideas, knowledge, and knowledge of nurses. That's a wonderful question. Thank you so much. Very much on our minds at the moment, I have to say, in our campaign. I've been talking with, well, at least online at the moment, but I'm shortly to have a conversation with a woman called Mary Beard, whom you might know. Mary Beard works at Cambridge University. She has written a book called Women and Power. Um, and I raise that really because she came up, she said something that was very um, interesting. Um, she was talking about um, the Rwandan parliament actually, which is mostly female now. And she said, you have to remember that you will find the most women where the power is not. Huh. And I thought that was extremely interesting. I mean, not to be too political, but um, I think that's probably true. So it's kind of made me look at this whole superhero, you know, all this stuff that's going on about nurses. Um, and another colleague of mine with whom we're having similar conversations pointed out something else. She said, the thing about a superhero is it could be a man or a woman. It's, you know, not defined at the moment. The, the one with the cloak that's going like this is, it could be either. And she said, what we need to do is to take it and claim it, to claim it, you know, to make of the superhero what we need and want in nursing. And it made me think about Florence Nightingale because, you know, we always talk about Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp and all this stuff. And I took the opportunity on Nurses Day to write about Florence Nightingale to say that were she alive today, she would be the woman with the spreadsheet. She'd be the woman with the massive Twitter following. Um, you know, that's, that's who she is. She's an influencer. She would be at the World Economic Forum, giving them the data and getting people to invest in changing conditions, you know, for soldiers in the Crimea. This is the person she was. And the, what we remember about her is the lady with the lamp. Well, she wasn't. She was a really badass woman, Florence Nightingale. <laughs> you know, she was going for it. She was a superhero. She wanted to change things. And that, I think, is what we need to be defining our superhero as. You know, OK, we are compassionate, but we are knowledgeable and we are courageous. 
You know, compassion does not, unlike passion, it's not a weakness. It's something that really makes you, can make you better at your job. And it's up to us to claim that image, that media image, because in the UK, we've been, honestly, it's been awful at times. They, they've had wonderful pictures of young doctors doing intensive care and coming off shift and talking about clinical care and pictures of nurses crying on the way home. I've been absolutely mortified. And we need to take hold of that and claim that. You know, we need to say, this is not all that we are. Yes, we're compassionate, but we're compassionate because compassion is important in applying our knowledge. And we're also knowledgeable. So I think, you know, passion, don't lose the passion, but let's claim our superhero image for what it is. Excellent, thank you, Ethan. Uh, Mary, do you want to add? I think Barbara did a great job. I don't have anything to add, thanks. Fantastic, thank you. Ifra, next. Uh, so we have a question from Dr. Paul-Andre Gauthier. Um, so he says, thanks, Mary, I love your passion. Um, his question is, what about the expertise and advanced knowledge of clinical nurse specialists who are under-recognized in our nursing profession? And he'd like feedback from the both of you. Um, would you just would you just uh, share that with me one more time? I was trying to write it down. The question that he posed the, the CNS the CNS role. Ah, okay, the clinical nurse specialist role. Thank you. Um, yeah. The, so so the visibility of that role has certainly ebbed and flowed, hasn't it? And the um, the deployment of that role, often like new roles, uh, 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 deploying into different settings, has has changed in different ways. I think that um, one of the most important things that we need to do as nurses, whether we're talking about CNSs, um, uh, certified nurse midwives, nurse practitioners, is to uh, establish the evidence base and the value of the particular specialty. And if there's confusion about that, when there's confusion about what that value add is, uh, and we see that periodically and with different roles for nursing, uh, that, that's, that, that's where we've got challenges uh, uh, um, in, in terms of how, how, how the public, policymakers, administrators of health systems think about using and applying the skill set and knowledge of those various groups, including, certified, uh, including uh, clinical nurse specialists. So it's to speak with one voice, have sharp clarity about the value that a particular uh, a specialty area brings to the table uh, and, uh, and communicating that clearly and consistently. That confusion and murkiness, as I said, that's not, that's not uh, um, a, a special to any particular uh, um, a category of nurse, if you will, it sort of ebbs and flows. But I do think what we have to do as an organization and, indivi and as individual nurses is to be very clear about roles, responsibilities, best utilization of the knowledge that in this case CNS is because you're asking about them, uh, best utilization of the knowledge that that uh, uh, um, a set of nurse providers brings to, uh, uh, the pub to addressing the public's health. And that's on us, that's on us to try to sort through that um, static lack of clarity. Sometimes you're gonna get that lack of clarity because we're pushing boundaries. We're deploying uh, nurses in new and different ways. So that murkiness and lack of clarity, sometimes that's part and parcel of, of, you know, of, of creating porous boundaries and new roles and, and responsibilities and opportunities for nurses. We've always gotta have in our mind how we, how we match that, we understand that exists, but then constantly match it with, uh, uh, with more and more refinement about those roles helping people understand what the value is so that they'll pay for it, accept it, use it. Um, that's the same battle that nurse practitioners fought at least in the United States for years. Uh, Barbara, any additions to the com to Mary? Uh, no, I agree absolutely with uh, what Mary says. Um, the, the single biggest influence on getting nurse practitioners embedded into the British health system was the cost effectiveness. Yeah. And we had to learn to play that game. 
So I do want to add a comment to Paul Andres, uh, to Dr. Uh, with your questions, because it's a very important one. I was a CNS. Uh, you were a nurse practitioner, Barbara, I was a CNS. Um, I think that there is a lot of learning about what happened, unfortunately, I will say, with the CNS role, uh, at least in Canada, where I know it best. Um, I think there is no other role, including nurse practitioners, whom I respect hugely, and they're all members of RNO, just so you know, uh, that has been researched more than the CNS role in terms of impact on outcomes. I think where we failed brutally, brutally in Canada with the CNS role um, is how it got enacted in the units where they were working, where we were working. Um, where the nurse practitioner role has been inserted as part of a system of care. And in fact, if you take them out in many of those places, the system will not function. The CNS role, as I recall it when I was a CNS, that's what brought me to Canada, by the way. CNSs were called to work on a complex situation. Most of my colleagues, at least in three places that I know, went, did their magic and left. Versus went, brought the nurses that called them together with them, did the magic together so they could role model and the others could see and value the role and then left and left them with the tools, with the capacity building to actually do the role. I think that's exactly where we felt. I think if every CNS, and I remember begging my colleagues at the time, including when I was director of nursing at Sinai, and there were a few that actually were fantastic in doing that and others for whatever reason, being rushed, personality, doesn't matter why, that continued to go do the magic and live. And so even within inside the profession, sadly, RNs, RPNs, which is in your country, LPNs, or others, when the role started to be yanked out with great pain to some of us, um, I was at the time at RNA already, yanked out with roots and everything from organizations to save budgets, quite frankly, nothing else. The we were talking, but the nurses in the units were not saying nothing. They didn't know what the CNS did. They only knew that they call her or him. That person did something and then they left. So this is a big learning number one for the CNSs that are now in the system to always bring others, right? So they see what we are doing. This is quite frankly a role for a chief nurse in an organization. So that if ever, and it happened at the time in Canada, no more now because we put a stop and we put it actually as part of the legislation, a renewal push for that in Ontario, I'm talking. There was a, there was a replacement of nurses, RNs, and master PhD preparers uh, that were chief nurse executives being taken, put by MBAs or whatever else. We stopped that with legislation. But it, 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 it really, to me, emphasizes the need for the frontline nurses, whichever one we want to call clinicians, to know what nurses in advanced practice do, how they do it, and that we are all on it together. Because it weakens the workforce of nursing hugely when we don't have that advanced practice level. So I just would add that dimension that is a learning for all of us to keep an eye on, that, that we need to work as a team, that everybody on that team of nurses is important, and that then if they yank one of those team members that has that advanced expertise, that we all scream. It's a bit like with the issue of the media, isn't it? Right? That we all need to speak. Yeah. Uh, if there are any other uh, questions, comments, please.
Um, yes, yeah, so we have one from John Glodoveza, um, and his question is, what is one thing you'll remind current student nurses about the nursing profession? That's awesome. And this will be our last question, uh, Ifra, because we will, I believe that we are close to closing. Um, any of you, well, both of you, both of you, and as you do that, Give us your, your departing thoughts before we close. Thank you, uh, Mary and Barbara, whichever wants to start. Actually, we started with Mary. Let's start with Barbara now. We will end with Barbara. No, then we start with Mary and Barbara, you will be the last one. Here we go, reverse order. Uh, the, the message to students, I'll answer that and then just make my closing comment. Uh, I would say um, if you want to, have maximum impact, if you really want to make a difference, this is the profession. You can do it with and through. If you want to have impact, you want to make a difference, this is the profession. This profession will open doors for you in ways that you never would have considered uh, it, where you sit as a nursing student. That was certainly true for me. I certainly never thought that I would, nor did I aspire to the positions that I ultimately held. But it was my nursing education that I pulled forward and used every single day to make a difference. So you'll um, never lose sleep at night that, uh, that what you're doing uh, doesn't matter. What you do as a nurse matters greatly, no matter where you work and what you're doing, as long as you pull forward the very values and the education, the expertise that you're learning in your educational program. That would be my one thing. I'll just start with my closing comment. That, that is that um, it's this. Since this year celebrates Nightingale's 200th birthday, I think it merits pointing out, as Barbara did, that she did not stop pushing for change inside healthcare, inside the walls of healthcare. She took her case outside of health settings to the public and to policymakers to achieve sustained improvement in healthcare. She clearly saw the need for both doing her clinical work and also doing her research and also using her voice. The World Health Organization's recognition clearly indicates that when it comes to health, the nursing profession's purpose and our values are not ancillary to achieving health. They are not optional. They are a predicate to health and to well-being around the world. Across Ontario and Canada and around the world every single day, nurses are helping to reset the health trajectory for millions of people, they are a pivotal part of the solution set to health problems from chronic illness to COVID-19. Nursing's voice is part of the solution to health and healthcare problems that run deep and wide across Canada and elsewhere. With the trust that we are afforded by the public and with the expertise that we have, nurses everywhere can have an impact as health leaders, problem solvers, innovators, and creators of new pathways to both deliver and to inform healthcare so that individuals, communities, and countries can achieve, can achieve better health. Thank you very much for the chance to be part of this today. Fantastic, Mary, fantastic. Barbara? Yes, thank you, um, Mary, and thank you all. Um, thank you, Doris, for the chance to be here today and to uh, read some of those wonderful questions, to hear Mary, to hear you. Um, the student nurse question I think is really interesting. I come from um, a kind of dynasty of nurses, really. Um, my mother was a nurse who trained in the war and she was a district nurse, a bit like call the midwife and used to go around on a bicycle. Um, I became a nurse and my pathway took me to the World Health Organization, to low income countries, to Afghanistan, to Palestine. Um, none of which, you know, some of which was harder than others, none of which I would have changed because it all makes you, doesn't it, as a person? But that was where, as Mary says, I used my nursing skills, I, I listened, I became a negotiator. WHO sent me to train as a negotiator because I listened. It was, <laughs> you know, and that, I learned to do that as a nurse, to listen to what people were telling me. Um, so the path you never know, my daughter became a nurse. She specialized, she was a clinical nurse specialist in cancer care. Um, she's now a psychotherapist. And my granddaughter is currently a nurse at Great Ormond Street in London. 
a pediatric nurse on the COVID-19 intensive care unit. So I learn something every day from, from her. So I speak, you know, four generations of nurses. I honestly believe as a student nurse, find a mentor, find somebody, don't be afraid, go and say to them, please, will you work with me? Will you help me find a path? Somebody senior, somebody older, somebody you think is wise, go and ask them. We've done that in nursing now. We've paired up some students with chief nurses. It's wonderful. You cannot imagine the effect of having a mentor who will really work with you. So don't be afraid and find your own pathway. You know, it could be any of these things, international work, specialization, AMP, it could be policy and politics, but you will never regret the skills you learn as a nurse, I can honestly tell you. I think going forward, um, you know, what's come through to me again here is that we need to find our voices. We need to find our agency, however we do that. And RNAO is a wonderful example of how you can do that together. Um, and so for me, one of the most important words is unite. We need to be united. We are together in looking for our solutions. And, you know, we need to celebrate being together and not start niggling away at the differences we can find. So it's been a great honor to be with you. You're a wonderful example as an organization, as a team, as to what we can do together. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Barbara and Mary. And before I open the mics to first clap collectively, but not yet IFRA, and before even I invite our immediate past president, Dr. Angela Cooper Brathway, and our new president, Morgan Offard, I just want to say to my, my colleagues, and this was virtual. Can you imagine if this had been live? Because as it is, I'm jumping from my chair every time these two women speak, like so inspiring, so inspiring. So get ready because we may do a repeat in person with a different topic next year, because really you, you, you both, uh, Mary and Barbara inspired us and gave us food for thought, gave us food for thought till no end and left us, I think all of us, with homework, whether at the individual level or as an association. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I know that the three of us will keep in touch, but on behalf of RNAO and on behalf of all the members, uh, just a big thank you. And Ifra put the mic for a minute, so we clap, clap, clap. And meanwhile, uh, we will connect also Angela and Morgan to say uh, closing remarks and departing remarks. And who knows, maybe Angela will sing for us again. Hey, Angela. Let's clap first. But we do the clapping at the end, Ifra. Maybe we do the clapping at the end. And then um, one of our comms uh, colleagues yeah. can take a picture. Let's do the clap at the end. Let's put first um, Angela and then Morgan, please. Yeah. I don't think you can join. I just want to thank Barbara and Mary for your outstanding presentation. It was invigorating, challenging, and we have learned a lot from you today. And I'm so grateful you were able to join us virtually to this panel discussion. I also want to thank all our participants, over 600 members or even guests joining us today, and also for your insightful questions that you raise, and it also stimulate discussions and allow us to expand and draw more information from our keynote addresses. I like to say this concludes our new 95th annual general meeting and the associated events which took place. We will very much look forward to greeting all of you again at our next annual meeting, which will take place June the 17th to the 19th, 2021. We are looking forward to celebrating 
together in person our next annual general, general meeting. And now I will call your, your president, Morgan Hobart, to give some remarks. Thank you. Ifra, can we put the, the videos on for our colleagues, Angela and Morgan? Yeah, more, um, Angela should be able to. Morgan's on the screen oh, now. Angela, put, put your screen that link on, please. And uh, Morgan, too. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Angela, and thank you, Mary and Barbara, for joining us. It was really great to hear from both of you and about your experience and about how to elevate our voices as nurses and speak out both at a kind of local level, but also at a national and international and provincial level. So it was really great to have that closing keynote. I wish we could have been together in person this year. It would have been really great to get to meet, but I'm hopeful. I love the idea of having a different panel presentation with the same speakers next year so that we're able to meet in person and hear all of your amazing insights about the role of the nurse um, clinically and also the role of the nurse in policy work. Thank you so much to all of our members who were able to join us over the past three days. This virtual AGM is new to all of us and I don't, not, it's been really great. It's actually been really much better than I expected it to be. It really felt like an AGM and it's been so great to get to see and hear from members. Um, my preference is definitely to see and hear from people in person, but it's been really great to be able to connect and to celebrate all that we've achieved as an association over the past year and to get re-energized to continue to move forward in the work that we do, um, the really important policy work that RNAO does and the really important supportive work that RNAO does for our members and for the patients and residents of Ontario. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of your weekend and I'm looking forward to seeing all of our assembly members in November. Hopefully we're able to get together in person then. And <laughs> if not, I see Doris has her- uh, We are not going. Oh, we have to do our cheer first. Of course so. we have to do our cheer for Mary and for Barbara today. Okay. <laughs> if are you going to open up everybody's mic so we can cheer? Uh, yeah, everyone has been unmuted, but we can't show video. So. so Mary, this is, and Barbara, Barbara, I think knows, but Mary, this is what we do every evening at 7.30. Today we are doing it in advance. We will post it at 7.30 and it's for the two of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you too. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And good to see Arlene Masaba from Qatar. <laughs> thank you. To Mary hey. Westfield and Wait to Barbara Stidwell for a tremendous panel, closing panel of our 95th AGM. Yay! Yay. Thank, you. thank you, Barbara and Mary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. See you next year. Yay. Great. For sure. <laughs> For sure.